to continue our, our series. It's becoming our favorite series. Say God. God. Say money. money. Say me. A little quieter on the money part, but hey, you know, you know, so many people, not you guys, you're pretty good. Uh, we don't want to hear church talk about money, but the truth is money's everywhere we go. I mean, you know, uh, Walmart wants your money. <laughs> if you're going to go camping, the state wants your money. If you're going to hunt or fish, they want your money. All right. Chick-fil-A wants your money. All right. Everybody wants your money. And so the truth is we need to know what God says about money and ourselves and how he can prosper us. Because the truth is God wants the church to prosper. And if the devil can keep us thinking poor thoughts and not living generous lives, then he keeps the church back from doing what it is the church is supposed to do. And when you look at statistics, even though I thank God that we are preaching the gospel, the church in general at large, there is so much more that still needs to be done. But financially, churches just don't experience the kind of wealth, I think, that God has intended because the people, the church, the body of Christ is misinformed about money. A lot of churches don't want to talk about it. Uh, we talk about it only occasionally, every four or five years. I might mention it from time to time, but it's rare. But we don't teach on it. We don't pass buckets, so you don't feel pressured. You'll see today, the Bible doesn't want us to feel obligated, but the Bible wants us to know that God loves for us to be generous. And it's all through the Word of God. In fact, there's no single topic that's mentioned more than finances and the things that we can obtain with finances, our possessions. And so God is very concerned, and we should be as well. Look at this, Proverbs 11, it says, when it goes well with the righteous, that's you and me. It says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there's jubilation. By the blessing or prosperity or liberal pool, that's what blessing means, by the liberal pool of the upright, the city is exalted, but it's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And so God wants the body of Christ to realize that living liberal lives financially, generously, the blessing, the prosperity can not only change the life of the church, it changes our communities. We can do things that we couldn't possibly do otherwise. How many know it costs money to do anything? There's a proverb that says that money answers all things. Somebody say all. And it's the truth. It takes money. People, for some reason, think, well, you know, the church will get it some other way. No, it won't. And it doesn't. It takes people to get involved. And so you and I need to know what the Bible says about living prosperous lives, not, not thinking poor thoughts, not thinking just enough thoughts. And even though finances can go up and down in life, I realize that, we can never think. I mean, I think of when we were early Christians, Trish and I, single-income family. Uh, Trish stayed home. She homeschooled our, all three of our children. And uh, there were times, you know, I thought, boy, I could make more money. And friends of mine, uh, even mentors of mine, said, man, how much do you make? I'd tell them, they'd be like, that's poverty level. I didn't know that. Trish and I have always lived this way. Even when we had little, man, we heard we were supposed to be generous. We became generous. We gave a tithe. By the way, we talked last week about the tithe, so I won't, I won't repeat all that. But tithe means 10%. Uh, some people think, well, yeah, that's the goal. Well, I'll give you credit for thinking that way, but I think 10% is the starting point. And then we'll see today, God wants us to be generous beyond that. And God taught us on a meager income, we'd write our tithes to the church that we attended, and then we had 10 different missionaries. We give every one of them $10, 100 bucks every month. Now, I could have done other things with that 100 bucks, But see, we didn't know we were poor. We knew we were blessed because what God had done for us, and we wanted other people to find out. And so we got involved in every way the pastor said to get involved. We got involved financially. We got involved in ministry. We got involved in outreach. We just did everything. And I am telling you, it has changed our lives. We, have, we never knew we were poor. Our kids never knew we were poor. Now, we may not have been able to take them to Disney World every year, and maybe that's important to you, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the truth is, when you think generous thoughts, your life is affected, regardless of how much money you have in the bank. When you're a generous person, you're generous. And you'll see it through Scripture this morning. That is true time and time and time again. But the Bible says this. I want to read it. Bring all the ties. It's interesting that it says all. I think it's because we're tempted to not do it. All the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now with this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven, pour such a blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. 
Again, I talked last week. You can get online and check it out. We've got all the teachings and the notes there. But I think that our, our tithe, 10%, uh, which I think is what we should do, should go to the local church. Whatever the, if you're here visiting, your local church where you're visiting from, that's where your tithes should go, not here. If you choose to be uh, generous and give us something, that, that's fine. That's, up to, that's between you and the Lord because it's all between you and the Lord. But even though we don't want to pressure you to give, we want you to know what the Bible says. Go tithe at your church. Start tithing at the church that you attend. If you're watching online, we're thankful that you're watching online. But if you never attend here, uh, we encourage you to find a church where you live that you can attend and tithe there. Am I telling you to give your tithe to somebody else? Yes. It affects your life, all right? It affects your life, plugging into a local body of believers. Hebrews 11, it says, But without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligent, all I want is more. More of you. We're singing that song, the last one we sang this morning. Diligence is how we get more of God. Now, you can't get more of God. God's God. He's big. He's eternal. He's everywhere. But the way we get more of him in our lives is when we die to self in our selfishness and our desires and our will and our wants. And we make his desire greater in our lives. That's how we get more of him. And the Bible says he rewards us. And I will say this. I don't think reward should be our number one motive for giving. That, that's really not what it's all about. It's giving out of a generous, thankful heart. But we need to know that God rewards us not only in this life, but in the life to come. We talked last Sunday uh, during our communion service. I talked about the benefits and rewards, if you will, that we obtain just because of what Jesus has done. His obedience brings blessing into our lives. But you know that our obedience brings blessing into our lives beyond that, and it brings blessings into other people's lives because we're being obedient and people are being reached with the cause of Christ. And it starts with thinking generous thoughts. And we should be generous in other ways, areas of our life, but I think it starts with finances. I really do. I think that's why the Bible talks about it so much. And what you believe, because James said this, James, book of James, it says, faith without works is dead. You can tell me that you believe all day long something, but if you don't do it, your faith is not active. Faith has works. Yes, we should speak. We should, we should speak the truth of God's word, the rhema word of God. But then there needs to be an action that goes with it. And so faith without works is dead. And so you and I, we, we need to believe that, you know, what we believe determines where we spend eternity, okay? What you believe in your heart determines where you spend eternity. What you do with that belief determines how you spend it. Uh, we talked several weeks ago when we started this, this series, Jesus talks about a reward, there are rewards. When we are faithful with little, then God gives us more, and we're faithful with much. And I believe in heaven. You think about the kingdom of heaven. That's what it is. It's a kingdom. We're not going to go to heaven and float around on clouds. Now, there is a holding place for those who pass on before the Lord returns. That's what we call heaven. All right? We're there with him spiritually. But then in the resurrection, we get a new body. And you know what? He comes back here and establishes his kingdom here on the earth. That's a promise of God, and it's very real. Then after about a 1,000 years, he has a new heaven and a new earth. And you know what? One thing about God, things are in order. Okay? The universe is not out of order. It's not spinning out of control. Somebody may tell you that, but that is not true. It is being held together by God's powerful word. And, and God is a God of order. And every kingdom has an order. And if you're going to have order, you're going to have ranks. You're going to have levels of position and leadership. That's the truth. God loves us all the same. But how many know there's different positions? It is just true. How many times have you heard it say the army of God, especially the Old Testament? Well, if God has armies, there's ranks. <laughs> Some of us know that better than others. And if you don't have ranks, you don't have order. You don't have an army. If the army is rebelling against their commander, there's no, there's no order. You don't win the victory. And so God rewards and gives position on the way we live life. So belief determines where we spend eternity. What we do with that belief, our works, faith, is what determines how we spend it, what position we have. But you need to be cheerful if you're going to give. <laughs> Let's read this. But I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Do you see that? You reap the way you sow, by the way. 
So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful. Somebody say cheerful. cheerful. Oh, louder than that. Cheerful. cheerful. Now let me hear you laugh. Oh, my goodness. All right. Read on verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Say toward me. Look to someone next to you. Say toward you. When we don't give grudgingly and we give as we purpose, we need to give to get in on this. Got to, got to give to get in on it. God's able to make all grace abound toward me that I, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Well, what's that? God wants me to give to give me more so I can give more. Now, we're supposed to live on a portion of that and have blessed lives. But that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to be faithful with what we have, to preach the gospel with every fiber of our being, starting with our finances. Then God knows that he can give us more, and then we're more generous beyond that. And that Bible, te- Bible says this. So many people know the scripture, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him would, would not perish but have every ter- everlasting life. Okay, God so loved that he gave. Jesus gave everything, every drop of everything, every position that he had, the authority he had, he laid it down. Why? To buy us, to purchase us with his blood. That's the example of giving. You just have it all. I am going to give so that others get in on this gift. All right, that's the example that Christ has set for each and every one of us. But we need to give cheerfully. You say, well, I'm not cheerful about giving. Then ask God to help you become cheerful. Start, start where you can and get cheerful about it. Make it a point of prayer. Say, God, I want to get excited about this because we need to. Don't give just because I taught on money. All right, don't do that. Um, if you can't give joyfully, I've said this before. I'll say it again. If you can't give joyfully, don't give. Keep it. You're going to need the money. You can't give well, I don't want to do this, but pastor said to. Oh, I wish I didn't have to write this check again. Please just stop. Please. So, pastor, you mean you don't want us to tithe? No, I want you to get a reward, though. If you don't give properly, you, you won't have a reward. If you don't give at all, there's not a reward. Not that You'll get the rewards that Jesus purchased. But if you don't give cheerfully, for, just keep the money. Keep the money. But can you imagine if the body of Christ would get a hold of this purpose. Because statistics prove not very many percentage-wise really get involved in giving financially at all or volunteering. And I realize there's some times in life we can't give a lot. There's other times in life we can't give a lot of our time, our talents to the church. But, you know, this is what we've got. People say, well, it's the pastor's job. It's the ones who get paid. Well, okay, the church is predominantly, as you probably are aware, a volunteer organization. We have the greatest volunteers. Many of you are volunteering in so many areas. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think every good organization should have some volunteers. People think, well, you know, when the church hires me, then, 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 I'll, then, then I'll serve. Well, okay. First of all, that's a bad attitude. We'll talk about attitude in a minute. Secondly, do you know we wouldn't need as many volunteers to do some of the stuff if the church had more money and could hire people? Think about that for a minute. Well, yeah, but the church is tax exempt. I, I get that, but it's based on the fact that we think the church should be poor so they don't have to pay taxes. I would rather have everybody giving, have this make a church as a status as a business, pay taxes, and reach more people. Yes. But see, we think poor thoughts. When it comes to money, well, the church, I can't afford. God knows I can't. No, God knows what you can and can't do, and he knows what you're doing with your money. And we, all, we talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You have to start where you are. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll give when I get more. That doesn't work. I think it was last week we talked about that. It doesn't work. You know how many times as a pastor I've had people say, well, you know, pastor, once we build our house, you know, once I just got to work, once I'm retired, whatever it is, so many things I've heard, then we're really going to volunteer at church. Then we're going to really start to give more money when we're not as busy and we got everything paid for. When I hear people talk that way, I'm, I'm not kidding. My, my heart sinks, and I think, please don't say that. Because I have had so many times people say that who aren't involved. They don't get involved. And if they do, it fizzles out. 
If you're not involved where you are, you won't, it won't change just because, think about it just financially. Statistics prove time and again, and you've probably read or heard some of this, people so much who win the lottery, millions of dollars sometimes, within less than a year, it's gone. Why? Because they didn't change their habits. You are who you are. Getting more doesn't change the way you think. We have to settle that. I'm just, say, I am rich. We are. We're rich in God. He has no lack of resources. We shouldn't think stingy. When we do, it cuts us off from more resources in the kingdom of heaven because if we think we can't do it, we're saying God wants to keep us poor. And you know that's not true. God wants us blessed abundantly. But he can only trust those who are willing to part with it and not just spend it on their own selfish things. It's just so true. But get cheerful. So sparingly, reap sparingly. So bountifully, reap bountifully. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom for the same measure that you use. It will be measured back to you. By the way, this works with more than finances. If you want to feel loved, love other people. This works with every area of, of, of life, including finances. But we got to give as we purpose. That's between you and God. Nobody can make you give a certain amount, but we're going to teach you what we believe the, body says, or the Bible says the amount is. Look at this, uh, NIV, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There is a joy in giving, and God wants us to give joyfully, joyfully, joyfully. And God will make all grace abound towards us so that we have more to give more. Philippians 4 says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And he's talking about the flip. If you read chapter 4, he's talking about not to be anxious and to make sure our thoughts are directed on good things. But then he starts to commend the Philippian church. He says that no other churchers partnered with us in preaching the gospel financially, partnered with us, except you. He commends them. No other church but one? You know, that, that statistics prove that. <laughs> and he says, I know my God will provide according to, and, 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 and see, the thing is, God provides and meets our need. But listen, there's a difference between needs and wants. There's nothing wrong with desiring things, but you can't desire things more than God. And you know, so much of the time, that's why we don't live generous lives is because we're so focused on paying the bills, getting the kids a good education. All those things are important. God knows they're important. But I am telling you, you will meet their needs better through God meeting your needs when you live a generous lifestyle. And again, I think we start with 10%, go beyond, because God wants us to sow beyond 10%, because just giving faithfully the tithe, that proves faithfulness. But when we go above that, that gives God something to really reward us on. Because we start to get into an area of prosperity beyond the tithe, and then God knows he can trust us, and he gives us an abundance. So that's where the real test happens. We think test happens when you tithe. Well, if you first start and you never have done it, there is a test. But there's a test beyond that. Because then when you start to walk in abundance, and you will, if you do it joyfully and faithfully, you will, you will have more financially and every other area of life. And then when you get more, the question is, when I get more money, what do I do? Do I buy a new set of golf clubs? I've tried golfing over the years. I just don't get it, and I'm not that good at it. I told someone the other day, well, I used to golf. I don't go very often anymore, but I always considered it a good day golfing if I left the course with the same amount of balls that I started with. They don't have to be mine. If you ever golf, you know, you just look along. My, my shots are always over here. There's a lot of shots over here and over there. <laughs> I just, oh, there's a ball. It's not mine, but hey, that's even better than the one I use. Boop, in the bag. <laughs> that's stealing, Pastor. No, everybody does it. It's not stealing. It's not against the golf course law. But, you know, what do I do? Do I, do I go buy a new gun, a fishing pole, a fishing boat, a new car? 
Nothing wrong with any of those things. But when we get more money, what's the first thing we, the first thing you think of, listen, when you get money, the first thing you think of when that money's in your hand is what's important to you. And God says, I want to be important. That's why when you direct your finances to the local church, God is important. The body of Christ is important. It changes your life. Living this way, Trish and I have met and retained so many friendships over the years. Um, I mentioned we used to support missionaries, ten missionaries, ten dollars. We give our tithe and then ten. You know that we have every one of those, except maybe one, just because we're just not in touch anymore. Uh, but we still have relationships with them. You say, well, that's because you gave them money. Well, in part, but we don't give them money now and they're still friends. It's, a, it's amazing. Jesus, in fact, he told a parable. Maybe I'll get into it next week. We'll see. I'm not going to look at it right now. He said that he talked about an ungodly man who was shrewd with business and finance. And he said he's more shrewd than the kingdom. The kingdom of darkness is more shrewd with money than the kingdom of light. And what he was saying is you need to make yourself friends with money. Because he said, you know, uh, he, he was wanting to take care of his future. He wanted to make sure he had a place to live because he was cheating people out of money, cheating his boss out of money. And so he went back and he cut all their payments in half because he knew he'd have to have a place to live. And Jesus said, make friends with mammon. What do you mean? He said, preach the gospel. That's what I believe. Preach the gospel. Win people for Jesus with your finances. He says, because then when they fail, they will receive you in eternity. You, what you do with your money receives you in heaven. I, I believe that firmly. We'll get to the parable next week, I promise. I'm not going to turn there today because I got a couple other things I want to say. And we got to get to the picnic. Oh, my. Um, I'm going to have to look at the clock, not the countdown, guys. You can take the countdown off there. That'll mess me up because we went a little long in worship. And I'm glad we did. It was a real sweet presence of the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. We're tested with need as we trust God with our sufficiency. We're tested with greed when we start to get an abundance. So how, when I look at money, what am I thinking about? That determines our heart, really, to be honest with you. And then where your money goes, your heart follows, all right? Um, and it really starts with, number one, realize all you have comes from God. Everything, nothing, you haven't obtained it on your own. There's no such thing as a self-made person. You may say, well, I'm a self-made man, or he's a self-made man, or she's a self-made woman. There's no such thing. Uh, the, what they have was given to them. On loan from God. <laughs> There's an announcer who used to say that, a radio personality. You know, every gift you have is on loan from God. It's the truth. Every gift, finances, your aptitude, your wisdom. You know, something that will help you, and some of us may not think this way. And by the way, we can always better ourselves. All right? We can always better. We should study to show ourselves approved. We should read. We should get advice from people who know something we don't need. But something I found out in life, and perhaps you have too, there are people out there that are smarter than me. They are just smarter. You ever meet someone that's like, how does their brain work like that? Again, it doesn't mean you can't improve yours, but I think people, certain people, you think of people, we call it inventing, they're just actually finding things that are already there, but inventors, those people are smarter than I am who invent things. Engineers and stuff, people, their brains work different than my brain works. And education helps, but there is a gift for that. You think about the medical field, and I thank God for the medical field. You are gifted to serve people that way. See, God gives you and makes you the way that you are, to be a blessing to other people. And there are people in your life that are smarter than you, so don't deny it. Get advice from them, and don't be jealous of them. Because you know what? They're probably jealous of other people for things they don't have, because nobody gets it all. And you and I need smart people in our lives. And we sure need the Word of God and this teaching. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. But everything comes from God, James 1.7. 17, rather. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Mm. Every gift. You know, every promotion that you get comes from God. Every advancement that you get comes from God. 
So wherever you are, be faithful. Be faithful to God. God has called us to be prosperous, to be generous. Psalm 35, it says, Let them show, shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure, pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God wants us to prosper. Period. He wants us to be prosperous people. Um, so you live prosperous lives. We, we have always taught our kids this. And they all, they all live this way. They serve, they give, um, they're generous. We tip when we go out to eat. Maybe you don't. Hopefully you do. But we tip. And we start at 30%. Sometimes we go more. We have given tips regularly of more than the bill was. You say, why do you do that? To open doors. That's why. Most of the time, I, I can, maybe there's been a time or two, but I don't remember it. We get a chance to pray with somebody. And our kids have seen that. And I'll never forget the first time our youngest son actually thought, I need to do this. And he's always been a tipper. But we all went out with a group of people from church, and we were eating. And uh, we're getting ready to pay the bill. And he leans over to me and says, I think the Lord wants me to give this woman a $100 tip. I said, that's the Lord. <laughs> okay, I mean, really. You know, nobody just wants to do that unless God's moving on their heart. All right? Especially not Christians, stingy bunch. Not this, not this group, but man, the first service? And people watching online, they're the stingiest of all. Say, why do you make fun of people online? Because they're not here. They can't catch me. <laughs> They'll probably get me next time they see me. But he, I said, I think you should do it. He gave that $100. I'm telling you, that, that young lady started to open up about a need that she had. We, we asked her if she knew the Lord. She did. We started to pray for her. We were right in the restaurant. I just started to pray for her. And you know, it's generosity that opened that. Generosity. And you can do it without finances. You can serve somebody. But certainly with finances, it works. And, and she was so thankful. We led her in a salvation prayer. We invited her to church. I don't think she ever came. But you understand, our main goal is not to get people to our church. It's, I mean, invite people to church, please. That's the least we can do, because a lot of us don't live the way I'm telling you. So the least we can do is invite people. But you know, our goal is not to get people to come to this church. They need a good church, and we recommend this one. But our goal is to get people into the kingdom. And so that's our ultimate goal. I've, I, have led, I have led more people to the Lord that never walked in this church than the ones who even come. I have, I'm just like you. I invite people. I got neighbors that I've invited for years. I don't know how many times I've been told by neighbors that I have relationships with. Some of them not even saved, but I have a relationship. Well, oh, I got to get to your church. I, we'll be there. We'll be there next week. And, you know, it doesn't happen. I think they mean well. But the thing is, other things come up that are more important. Heck, that keeps Christians out of church. <laughs> well, two people laughed. Um, but, you know, because <laughs> things are more important. Again, there's nothing wrong with vacation. You know, we got people taking some time away. Pastor J.D. and Sarah, they're taking a few, three or four weekends off, and volunteers are helping. Thank you, guys. They couldn't get any full weeks off. They said, we just need to camp. I said, go camp. Just take care of it and go camp. They're, they'll be at the picnic today. And they're here on Wednesdays, but they're just taking some weekends because it doesn't make sense to check in to camp Friday night and then pack your kids up at 8 in the morning Sunday and come to church and then lead a ministry. Kids do not want that. Stay the night. It just, it's just easier. But, you know, I have people that I've asked for you, and I never see them in church, never see them in church. I'm thinking of two neighbors of mine right now that we have good relationships with them, really. They're front, we eat with them. We, we talk to them, uh, help each other out. I mean, you know, I get home from church the other day. One, one guy's putting my mailbox straight. He says, why don't you straighten that mailbox? I said, I don't know. It, they put mail in it. It still works. <laughs> so the ground has started to sink a little bit like this, you know. I just left it. They're still throwing it in there. He says, well, we need to do that. I said, do you have a post hole digger? Because I wasn't going to buy one. I, said, I don't plan on digging a bunch of post holes. So I didn't. And I thought, well, I'll get around to it. <laughs> he says, no, we'll do it. I said, okay, let me know. Come on over. We'll, you know, we'll, I'll even do the grunt work. I'll dig the hole. You just help me get it straight. 
<laughs> we come home one day and he's already got it done. It's like, you know, so we have relationships, but you know, people may never come to church. Don't stop asking them. But the biggest thing is don't stop loving them. Because they, they will see that you're different. All right, Winston Churchill said this. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Generosity has to be the core of a Christian person. And when we're not, we are not thinking like God. But a generous man devises generous things, Isaiah 32. By generosity, he shall stand. He shall stand. Well, let's see. Here's what I'm going to do. If you want to know some of the points I got to, because there's more of them, you need to get online and listen to first service because we're out of time. Say, I, I am, am prosperous. prosperous. I, I will prosper more. I, I am generous, generous, and I will be more generous. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.